Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Marty McBride, and I'm the Managing Director at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and I'm joined today by my colleagues David and Nantikoso from the CDSB Secretariat. So we can uh, introduce you to our new climate guidance, which is to help enhance reporting quality in reporting by addressing the lack of precision useful material and climate information available for investors. This guidance has been produced in response to the questions I get asked and our team and the Secretariat get asked every day. How do I do it and what does it look like? And, uh, and we get asked these more and more and more as, as people try and do the TCFD and climate becomes a bit more of a business norm. The release of the climate guidance this week is especially timely as it comes just after the Financial Stability Board has also highlighted that evidence, uh, efforts to quantify climate-related risks are being hindered by the lack of consistent data on financial exposures to climate risks and difficulties that companies are finding in translating climate change outcomes into changes in those exposures. The TCD has released a set of recommendations this guidance that we'll be talking to you about today can play an important role in shifting the support for TCFD to action. And that's where we're seeing it fall short at the moment. This is also quite an important day as it marks the first in a series of interpretive guidance resources CDSB will be issuing to give report preparers an additional layer of support, something we, we hear a lot and, and can't produce enough of. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to some slides and make a quick introduction to the CDSB and our framework to set the scene for David and Nontokozo to take over and talk further about the guidance and, and corporate practice. As we're moving along, if any questions do arise, please pop them in the chat function on the side and we'll try and address them as we go along, but we'll also have time for questions and answers um, and, and discussion at the end. So as I said, please pop them in there. And uh, I will jump straight into CDSB. So CDSB, for those that aren't familiar with, with our work, we were set up at the World Economic Forum in 2007 um, to help get climate and latterly, we moved to expand to environmental information to be reported to capital markets with the same rigor, quality and value as financial information. Next slide, please, Julia. And this was, and I guess our mission, our real purpose is to make sure that we're getting decision useful environmental and climate information to markets via the mainstream corporate report. So a piece of uh, reporting that happens every single year to companies. So actually tying it across the business's strategy, risk metrics, remuneration, audit functions, et cetera. And next slide please, Julia. Our board, um, as I said, we're a board. We are, we are a nine organizations that sort of come together and lend their effort and support to this initiative. We're chaired by the World Economic Forum and we're housed inside CDP. So they provide the global secretariat on behalf of the board and lead the sort of strategic direction of CDSB's work. We're also supported by an insanely talented group of individuals. And thank you to those that are on the call today that are part of this group that actually help us with our technical work. They give us that, make sure we have that technical board threshold, that everything um, is practical for the market, that we're thinking ahead, that um, we're pushing the boundaries and we're solving those challenges that prevent companies from reporting a decision useful information in a consistent comparable way to capital markets in the environmental, including climate space. And, then, and this is just a snapshot here of those, uh, of those individuals. Next slide, please, Julia. And so the CDSB framework, um, it's all a bit back to front here today, um, but the CDSB framework, um, the CDSB, it sounds a lot like the IASB when we were set up, and that's for a good reason, because the IASB, like CDSB, um, has, has followed in its footsteps. It focuses on financially material information. So everything that Dave is talking about through the guidance when he runs you through that later will be with reference to financially material information. Our framework is based on principles and requirements of the how and what to report. We have a rigorous standing setting process that mirrors the IASB's process and similar sort of due diligence. And, and to date, we have over 455 companies that refer to the CDSB framework in their annual reporting. Next slide, please. 
The CDSB framework maps directly alongside the TCFD recommendations. Uh, our technical working group chair says you can't put a you can't put a cigarette paper between the two. The TCFD built directly off CDSB's framework. Um, so the guidance that we are launching today can play a huge um, role in helping you with your TCFD reporting, which David will touch on later. And so just a bit more of the framework for those that aren't familiar with it. Next slide, please. It's it, it's broken down into principles, so very similar to what you know from corporate governance, good corporate governance reporting for those of you, those, those of you familiar with um, corporate governance standards around the world in accounting language. And then we have the requirements again for those that are familiar with uh, accounting uh, language. You will again see a lot of the, the common language there drawn from the conceptual framework of the IASB. Next slide, please, Julia. And as, as we sort of alluded to at the beginning, I am very excited because this is the first of a series of interpretive guidance we are releasing to support implementation of the CDSB framework. And uh, not only am I hugely excited about that, and I think it'll go a long way to continue to support report, report preparers to start and improve um, and develop best practice in this space. But, uh, you know, it also also shows, again, just the momentum that this area area is getting in non-financial reporting that there is such a huge demand. So climate will launch today. We have recently set up an expert working group on water, which will, um, we have nearly 60 global water and corporate reporting experts on that group that are now working to develop that really rigorous guidance to support on water. And in the, in the future, we have guidance planned on biodiversity and sort of land use forest based and potentially even social issues. So watch this space and, uh, and, and just keep seeing what what is what is going on because we're uh, we're getting an awful lot of uh, requests for these. So we may have, may even have ad hoc guidance notes that come out um, along the way to support report report repairers. So without um, further ado, I I will be quiet on a CDSB, and I'll hand over to David to talk us through the guidance now. David, uh, David at CDSB, and this might help you with your questions as well, ladies and gentlemen, is my go-to. He knows everything there is to know about how standards and reporting frameworks fit together, how they don't fit together, where the differences are, and how you can use them all uh, for, for your reporting. David is very qualified in doing that because David led CDSB's research for the reporting exchange, which you may be familiar with, with WBCC, which is a massive global database of all regulation and reporting requirements in this space. And he was also the author of the Better Alignment Project that the Corporate Reporting Dialogue launched last year, which just showed how synergistic all these frameworks were linking together. Prior to that, he's worked for a number of other environmental think tanks and written on climate change issues. Um, he also holds a Master's of Earth Sciences from Oxford University. He is busy working on a Master's now in his spare time. Can you believe it? In his spare time with all of those other things going on. So please, David, take it away and introduce us to the climate guidance. One second, just having a little technical issue. Um, thank you, Mardi, for that introduction. Uh, very complimentary. Um, so yeah, I was the lead author of the climate guidance, and I'll talk through a few examples of what the guidance can offer to companies. But first, I want to set the scene for the guidance and quickly discuss the relationship of climate change and business. The world's climate policies presently set us on track for three degrees of warming by the end of the century well beyond the 1.5 degree ambition of the Paris Agreement. For the best chances of meeting the ambitions of 1.5 degrees, global emissions need to fall by over 7% per year through to 2030 and reach net zero by 2050, which will necessitate fundamental structural changes to the global economy. For a perspective on the scale of change, during the peak of the coronavirus lockdown earlier this year, which saw the economies of China, Europe and the US come to near standstill, daily emissions went down by 17%, with the annual emissions for this year estimated to fall by somewhere between 4 and 7%. The clear-cut nature of these numbers, though, can hide the complex reality of climate change and its relationship to environments and societies around the world. The impacts of climate change will not be linear and certain, but instead the result of highly dynamic and interconnected systems across both geography and time. This requires thinking and action that is integrated and iterative. Increasingly, though, companies are better understanding the scale and complexity of impact and change that will be brought by climate change. And some are beginning to feel the impact on their bottom line. 
the risks and opportunities posed by climate change can be roughly split into two fields, physical and transition. The former relating to direct climatic and environmental changes brought by global warming, such as sea level rise and extreme weather, and the latter transition risks and opportunities relate to the business impacts of reorienting and decarbonizing the global economy, such as free regulation and technological change. And just as companies and investors are increasingly taking note of climate change, so are financial regulators, especially since the publication of the TCFD recommendations. Many see there to be an inevitable policy response to mainstream material climate-related disclosures. Indeed, scaling up climate reporting will be a key feature of a significant COP meeting next year. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, so it's, it's for these reasons, the scale and complexity of change, the increasing impact on business and the inevitable policy response that CDSB has produced the Climate Application Guidance to help companies best report material climate information to their investors. If we can move to the next slide. So as Marty noted, the Climate Guidance has been designed to fit with and complement the CDSB framework. It offers companies that identify material climate risks and opportunities with an additional layer of detail that takes account of the specific characteristics and developments for climate change in business. The guidance provides report preparers with, suggest with the suggestions and processes to develop high quality mainstream disclosures. The CDSB framework was already very well aligned with the TCFD recommendations as shown previously. Uh, but the climate guidance ensures that companies can most effectively and efficiently disclose against the recommendations and advance their reporting. The guidance is designed around the first six of the 12 reporting requirements of the CDSB framework. These six requirements set out the substantial reporting content for companies. For each, we offer preparers with additional detail and reporting suggestions, summary disclosure checklists, additional useful resources, and quality reporting examples. So I'll next focus on three of those reporting requirements, giving an overview of what the guidance can offer in terms of reporting suggestions before Nanto takes over and discusses the checklists, resources, and exam reporting examples. So the first example concerns governance arrangements for material climate issues. So the most innovative, far-reaching, and successful climate strategies often require leadership and integral support of the highest areas of the company. For this reason, it is essential for investors to understand who or which body is responsible at board level for climate strategies and who is driving such strategies and targets within the management. It should be the case, not only that report users are able to understand who the decision makers are, but they should also be confident that these are the correct arrangements in terms of skills, experience, and external advice. When setting out the governance and management systems for climate issues and strategies, it's useful for report users to be able to understand the information flows that are essential to effective oversight and decision making. Report preparers should answer questions such as, how often do management update the response, those responsible at board level on progress against climate strategies and targets? Uh, how often does the whole board discuss climate change, risks and opportunities in the strategy, and where appropriate what are the strategic mechanisms in place to ensure resilience? Another key area of demonstrating oversight and effective governance relates to ownership and incentivization of strategies. Disclosures, disclosures should be clear on how those responsible for climate issues are incentivized, setting out as plainly as possible the key targets or expectations that are used in such schemes. Investors should be able to see that these incentives speak directly to the company's most pertinent related risks and opportunities. Finally, given the potentially unique nature and prominent investor interest in climate risks and opportunities, it is important to be as clear as possible on the specific governance of these issues, whether that is if they are treated as any other material risk and opportunity, or if they're treated uniquely, or as part of a broader environmental strategy. If we can move to the next slide, please. So the third reporting requirement of the CDSB framework asks companies to report on the material and anticipated risks and opportunities. So, while perhaps stating the obvious, it is essential for disclosures to properly detail the climate-related risks and opportunities they have identified. Unfortunately, uh, it is still common to see companies reporting climate change as a risk with little of a detail and seemingly as a spot response. 
be useful to report users. Disclosure should be specific, with the risks and opportunities speaking directly and understandably to the sectors and areas of operations, business plan, strategy, and ambition of the company. In addition, the appropriate timeframes over which to assess client-related risks and opportunities are dependent on the nature of the assets of each company. It's important for companies, then, to set out the time horizons over which they assess climate issues and the reasoning behind them. In addition to this qualitative information, it can be useful, to re it can be useful for report users for these risks and opportunities to be quantified where possible. Um, so as to better understand the potential financial impact and weigh appropriateness of response. The assumptions and key figures behind these valuation calculations, as well as the uncertainties, are key to assuring that this financial data is as understandable and as verifiable as possible. Finally, for climate risk and opportunities, it is key to ensure that the disclosures are properly connected with other aspects of the annual report as encouraged by the third principle of the CDSB framework. Essential to this, sorry, essential is to draw users' attention to the reporting on the processes and systems for the identification and assessment of risks and opportunities, and whether and how they accommodate the unique characteristics of climate change issues. For instance, for instance, have horizon scanning, sensitivity testing, or scenario analysis been used for these purposes? Likewise, benefits the report user for connections to be made from risks and opportunities to strategies and governance, providing a clear and holistic picture of corporate understanding and response. If we can move to the next slide, please. So for the final example, we can consider disclosures on Outlook, which should build on the previous five reporting requirements and offer investors a considered summary of the long-term effects of climate change on the company's performance and position. Given the complexity of climate change and its far-reaching impacts on business, scenario analysis and similar tools can be particularly useful when developing high-quality outlook disclosures. There is no special or correct formula or way of conducting scenario analysis. It can be highly quantified and outsourced, or it can be more qualitative and conducted in-house. What's important is for investors to be able to understand the resilience of the company to a suite of possible climate futures. This suite should be broad. There is no certainty of effective climate action after all. So that means considering from rapid technologically enabled transition to beyond business as usual warming trajectories. Disclosures should then set out for the investors how the company is acting to lessen the potential impacts understood through these scenarios, such as reworking strategy or mitigating against identified issues. To ensure understanding of and confidence in these disclosures. Companies need to be clear and reasoned in the scenarios they have used, and the, the assumptions that they have made, the timeframes adopted, and the uncertainties of the processes. For example, do the growth assumptions of the climate scenarios fit with those projected elsewhere by the company? Uh, do the choice of physical and transition scenarios match with where the company operates? Finally, reporting on outlook resilience and scenario analysis should be treated as an iterative exercise, something that companies seek to develop and improve each year. The quality of climate science and projections improves each year. National and international policies are updated and implemented. And the reporting by companies that have identified material climate risk and opportunities should keep a pace and account of these changes to ensure that it's best placed to meet its challenges. If we can move to the next slide, please. So when setting out to use the climate guidance with the CDSB framework to prepare mainstream disclosures, there are a few more key considerations to take into account. First, relevance and materiality are central to the mainstream report, and the disclosure suggestions of the climate guidance should be subject to such tests. It might be that all the suggestions are applicable to one company, but only a small number are to another on account of materiality determinations. Principle one of the CDSB framework offers a set of useful tests to help companies determine material climate disclosures. Second, the CDSB framework holds that the reporting boundary and timeframe for disclosures should be equivalent to financial disclosures. We haven't made clear where this isn't the case. This consideration is particularly important for the more backward-looking disclosures, such as results 
and performing against targets. An obvious example is scope-free emissions, which are likely to fall outside the financial reporting boundaries, but can be a key indicator for certain companies and sectors. But this consideration can also be important for other aspects of reporting, such as material climate risk, not, such as material climate risk that were identified in specific areas of a company's supply chain, for instance. Finally, it will be the case that companies are already reporting against these requirements and suggestions, both within and beyond their mainstream report. It's important for companies to think how they craft, structure, and label their disclosures to ensure that the connections between different aspects of the report are easily understood by users. Similarly, uh, companies should try to use existing climate disclosures, such as CDP submissions, index questionnaires, and sustainability reports, to generate the mainstream material client reporting. This will benefit consistency and create a more efficient reporting process for companies. For example, CDSB's recent building blocks guidance with CDP provides report preparers with the means of using the CDP submissions and the CDSB framework to meet the TTFD recommendations in the mainstream report. I'll pass back to Marde, who will now take us on to the next section. Thanks, David. That was great. Can I just, um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. There's one I just want to, well, there's two here which will actually set the context a bit more. So if you don't mind, I'll just pose those quickly. Um, on materiality, Asian companies have been referring to using SASB's materiality mapping. How is SASB's different with CDSB's? Well, SASB um, typically offers companies a set of likely material uh, issues for them to report against. So the company should still conduct their own materiality assessments and then decide which of the SASB recommended metrics they should report against. And that very much aligns with the CDSB framework. Um, CDSB have worked with SASB on a number of different publications um, to help companies report on climate issues. And yeah, we see a lot of synergy between the framework and their standards. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to the company's own materiality determinations. Thanks, David. That was very uh, comprehensive. I always say SASB be very good for companies that don't know what is material or what 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 what, what they should be looking for to go and have a good look um, and, and prepare and structure their data a bit, like with CDP as well. Um, and then you can put that in your annual report. Um, because the purpose of putting it in the annual report is that it's connected to the strategy, the governance, the risk, the audit functions, rather than just sort of set alone, um, fully integrated through reflected in the numbers. So in that respect, SASB and CDSB are very complementary processes. Now, David, last question for you before we hand over to Nonto. Um, where does CDSB fit in the sort of uh, the value chain? So, for example, are we a disclosure framework? Are we a provider of data? And how do we work with corporates to start on this climate journey? So maybe we'll leave the last part, but I'll bring that with Nonto later on. If you could talk about where we fit, please. Yeah, so CDSB is a framework provider um, and now offering guidance as well. Um, yeah, but the CDSB framework provides the kind of um, the what and the how of um, reporting in the mainstream report on the material environmental issues. Um, so we also work closely with CDP, who are more of a data platform, data provider, um, but we're quite distinct. We're about reporting this in the mainstream report, um, and we're not about reporting things separately. Thanks, David. And uh, they were on our website, which unfortunately we don't have them in the deck today, but on CDSB's website, and in the Better Alignment Project report that I mentioned, David, authored earlier, there are some great infographics that can demonstrate how the different reporting frameworks and standards all fit together to be complementary. Um, I'll see if I can dig them out while Nontico is speaking and pop some links in the uh, in the chat for everyone to, to reference, or maybe, David, you could do that um, uh, while Nontico is talking. So, without further ado, a bit more of the practical side of things. Nontico is our Corporate Engagement Manager here at CDSB. And she supports companies with their mainstream of reporting on climate and environmental issues. She's currently got a focus on EU companies and providing feedback on disclosures under the non-financial reporting directive and the task force on climate related financial disclosures, amongst many other different aspects. She's got over 10 years banking experience and asset experience in banking, insurance, asset management, 
which includes corporate governance and sustainability functions. And uh, I know she's enjoying talking to all the companies. We've had so many of the moment. It's, there's just so much interest in this space. It's really exciting. Um, so Nautikova, can I hand over to you, please, to keep, to keep that going and tell everyone what you're seeing from a practical perspective? Thank you, Marty, and uh, thank you, David, for that nice um, introduction that really gave the background to the guidance. So um, just following up on what Marty just said in terms of what we're seeing with companies and when we engage them, um, some of the common disclosure challenges that we are seeing, uh, which the guidance actually helps companies to address, include the fact that we find that companies often want to disclose climate-related information, but they also want to avoid lengthy disclosures. When, um, where information can actually get lost. And there's also the question of what is appropriate in terms of um, what amounts to effective disclosure, so what should they be including um, in order to aid decision usefulness of uh, the information that's provided. And we also find that um, companies also want to know how to structure the disclosure within the mainstream reporting. So um, the place, the issue of placement of the information, so that's the commonly um, sort of a frequently asked question um, by companies. And a related uh, challenge that we're seeing with companies is also the how to actually make the information easy to access. So one of the companies actually asked us that information about what's the best way to set sort of set out information, whether it's for uh, a TCFD alignment um, type disclosure in the mainstream report. So um, yeah, so these are some of the questions and um, that we're seeing and Hopefully, um, uh, when you actually, as a company, go through the, the guidance, you can be able to use it for that. And then just to touch on um, some of the useful tools that you actually find in the guidance. Um, so you find the, uh, there's a check, there's checklist. You might have seen those on David's slide already, and which actually help companies to actually um, disclose um, with regards to climate-related aspects and resources that are recommended, which actually support and uh, give companies that additional background. And then you also have uh, good practice examples. Uh, CDSD loves to, to, to use good practice examples, and companies actually like that because it actually helps them to see what sort of um, companies that are leading with regards to mainstreaming this information are what they're actually doing. And then something else that's useful is um, mapping uh, the CDSD framework aspects to TCFD recommendations. So this, again, clearly demonstrates that you can use uh, the CDSD framework to align with the TCFD recommendations. So I'm um, coming back at that. And then moving on to sort of the first uh, requirement, uh, which which is actually um, the governance requirement. David has already um, elaborated a bit on that, so I will not um, go into uh, too much detail. But the disclosure checklist extension is what you can see here on the screen. And with governance, really, it's really about ensuring that um, companies actually disclose a high level of transparency and accountability with regards to oversight of climate-related issues. So you, what you want to check is that um, the disclosure actually articulates clearly where responsibility with regards to climate-related issues lies. And also you want to uh, mention in the disclosure how um, delegation is done within um, the company with regards to climate related policies and strategy as well. And then there's the issue of accountability and incentivization. And there with incentivization with regards to climate related policies and strategy um, at a, a board and management level, you want to ensure that those um, are actually linked to uh, what's relevant to, to the company. So you wouldn't use the same incentives across um, sectors, for example. And then another, um, just to touch on again, um, I know, so again, I know David has already touched on this aspect, but it's very useful to explain whether there are separate governance uh, mechanisms that are available for um, climate aspects, which are separate to other material concerns. So this kind of highlights that for investors who are looking at the information and also in case that the company is paying uh, close attention to those issues where it's necessary for that particular company. And then uh, just a good practical example that we like is um, that of Aviva with regards to governance. So Aviva has a specific section on climate-related financial disclosures, and they actually clearly show um, who's responsible for um, climate-related risks at both board and management level, 
and we also like that they actually show how climate related assets are actually integrated into overall processes. They again have a, a board training program relating to climate related risks and opportunities, which really shows again the emphasis of these issues at a, at a high level within Aviva. And then the other, the other uh, checklist that I'd like to highlight, which is under requirement two, which really is about uh, management um, environmental policies and strategies. And this particular one is actually about showing that um, how um, management looks at um, issues and structures um, for policies. And also the first aspect are, um, that companies need to check when they're disclosing under this is whether they've actually explained natural capital dependencies for the company. So natural capital contextualization in the disclosures helps to allow um, companies to actually explore the emerging risks and opportunities from the interconnection of various issues. This provides a fuller understanding of risk and opportunities and which are faced um, by the company within this web of um, natural systems. So it gives investors a fuller context. And companies must also check whether the the climate um, policies and strategies linked to the company's overall strategies and where there are actually other climate disclosures within the report, the connection between these should be clearly shown. So it's really about that connectivity and that full um, clear, uh, that clear picture for investors who are looking at the report, particularly in, in the mainstream report. And then another aspect I'd like to highlight is that of resourcing. So both for um, personnel and the financial side of reporting, it's very important. And particularly for companies where there's a large capital investment that may be required with regards to um, climate strategy aspects, or where there's actually reorganization of the, um, sort of the whole company um, in order to actually meet this climate ambition. So resourcing then becomes critical to highlight in the reporting. And then uh, just finally on this one, setting targets um, and timelines and indicators, very important and uh, as well as the met and as well as the methods and the baselines and showing the progress against uh, these uh, policies and, and strategies. And uh, something else I'd like to highlight is again to refer back to the overall strategy. So um, linking the targets to overall strategies so that they're not just seen in isolation. Um, when an investor is uh, looking at the report. And then the next one is actually uh, risks and opportunities. Again, something that David has already touched on, but really with the risks and opportunities is about providing a sufficient level of detail, specifying key characteristics of the risk. Companies often um, do not do that. They really talk about the risk, risk at a high level and ensuring relevance. So relevance with regards to time frame and also where these risks and opportunities lie, whether you're talking about the supply chain, as you can see, the second checklist item talks about explaining the strategic, geographic and operational financial supply chain implications. So where do these actually um, issues lie? And also um, speaking in your reporting about the systems and processes for addressing, identifying, monitoring risks and opportunities and whether or not they're integrated into existing risk management systems and processes, which um, is very much a, a TCFD um, type of disclosure. As we mentioned, that this um, that they are not only the guidance linked to uh, TCFD, but the overall T uh, CDFD framework is linked to that. And then a good practice example that we like is that of caring. In their registration document, they actually detail the risk using icons, which you can see here. And these icons actually um, depict the probability of the impact with regards to climate related aspects, the severity of the risk, and also um, the area of impact. And then they really go into detail describing the risk and giving case, cases and sort of examples around what those risks could be. So, again, lots of detail and also the actions to address. Um, this risk, climate related risk. And then the next one is the material sources of environmental impact. So, um, this is actually uh, something that a lot of companies uh, we often um, do not understand in terms of starting um, with regards to the material aspects, which David again has um, spoken about. But um, just to uh, touch on the CSB framework and what it actually says. So it suggests that companies disclose the results of material sources of environmental impact 
within the mainstream report. And then with principle one of the framework, as David touched on that again, where um, talks about um, how companies can actually um, determine the relevant um, material information to, to, to um, include in the report. And then um, the key thing to note is that scope one and two, JG emissions are actually regarded um, as um, material climate impact to include in the, in the mainstream report. So companies immediately know what to start with with regards to disclosure, and these would be absolute and uh, normalized matrix that are disclosed. So um, I like this because sometimes companies don't know where to start, so it, it really helps with that. And then companies should, should also explain um, these climate impact metrics that are used, elaborate on the methodologies, any levels of uncertainty with regards to the metrics, and also provide narrative to sort of give the investor looking at the reporting um, some more context. And then the final point on this one is that um, where, where relevant companies can actually categorize or disaggregate metrics to support understanding and comparability. So um, separating information out where it makes sense, for example, where um, you as a company you think that a risk is more pronounced in a particular region, you may want to sort of um, separate that information out and highlight it more. And explaining why you did that is also important to give more context. And then um, just requirement five of the CDFD framework uh, relates to performance and comparative analysis. So here it's really about showing um, a full kind of, of giving a full picture of what has happened. So um, appropriate historical data um, and, and with regards to material um, in climate impact to allow for useful comparison. And something that I'd like to highlight is here is that sometimes companies actually show um, narrow data set windows, so companies should avoid that. And where there are sort of gaps in long-term reporting, that is also not some not advised in order to give that full picture. And contextualizing the performance of baseline targets and criteria that are used to assess progress is very important and showing major trends, not just um, political and economic trends, but also business development aspects that may affect um, the nature of the information that is actually being disclosed for uh, performance and comparative analysis. So giving that, that background. And then an example that a case study um, sort of that we like is Astora Enzo one. So Astora Enzo actually shows um, they are sort of normalized um, data with regards to GHG emissions, and they link that to scenarios, so which really gives sort of um, internal context, and they also provide the external context uh, using the scenarios. So it's a very good one for companies to, um, to refer to, that you can see here on the screen. So it's very um, useful for comparability. And then um, the last one of the, of the ones that actually covered within the guidance, which is the, the outlook. And David, again, has gone into a lot of detail talking about scenario analysis. So explanations here are key. Um, we understand that scenario analysis and uh, looking at um, forward-looking information can actually be a complex exercise. So the more explanations regarding this, um, the better. So identifying and explaining time horizons that are used for reporting corporate outlook, explaining techniques, so methods, and that inform the, the outlook, any um, the scenarios that are used. So um, as per as you saw for Story Enzo and also assumptions and any shortcomings and uncertainties with regards to the exercise that, that was conducted. So um, all, overall, this is a very um, iterative process when you're actually trying to report on climate-related risks and opportunities and using this information um, regularly to kind of feed back into the risk management policies and strategies. So being kind of um, pro, um, re, say proactive or reactive um, um, to the information that you are actually getting, um, given the changing nature of um, climate risks and opportunities and the complexity of the issues that may arise. And then uh, just moving on to some of the resources that are in the climate guidance that actually can help companies to actually um, disclose effectively with regards to climate related aspects that highlight. Not all of them are here, but as you can see of the World Economic Forum, 
um, uh, documents with, uh, which helps companies sort of set up um, climate governance um, aspects um, within boards. So very useful documents with uh, some guiding principles and questions. Then there's also the natural capital protocol. I spoke about the natural capital dependencies, so a very useful um, document to help companies really understand that. And of course, you have the TCFD as well as the World Business Council on Sustainable Development ESG Disclosure Handbook, the famous um, greenhouse gas protocol, and then you also have some frameworks and standards. I know that somebody's already um, touched on um, SASB and Marty has um, spoken about that, but again, some of the frameworks that we think support reporting around um, climate-related aspects. And then at CDSB, we do have some uh, very uh, useful resources um, that we purchased over the years, some more recent. So we have got the TCFD Good Practice Handbook, which has um, some case studies. Um, companies, again, I said, love that, uh, which highlights uh, good practice on TCFD disclosure. And then there's a TCFD implementation guide, which contains some mock examples that companies can use to disclose in the um, TCFD, and then the building blocks paper that was uh, recently released, which kind of helps companies who are disclosing under CDP sort of structure their disclosures and then um, use that information to integrate it into mainstream reporting using the CDFD framework and ultimately um, align with TCFD. So it's a very uh, useful paper to have a look at. And, um, and then, of course, like I mentioned, some past papers that are very useful, I want a materiality as well, um, for those that are interested in that. And then, and a very important is the TCFD Knowledge Hub, which contains, again, case studies and a wealth of information really about how to align with TCFD. There's the uh, e-learning courses that are freely available there, which we've seen a lot of companies actually take an interest in, so we're very pleased by that. If, um, to help companies who are not only starting out, but even those that are sort of want to zoom in on specific topics, whether it's um, strategy or matrix as well under TCFD. Thanks, Nonto. That was great. And I can't stress enough, Gemma Clements and the CDSB team powers the TCFD Knowledge Hub. We spend a lot of time making sure that the best resources are on there. And if you happen to be one of those companies uh, or you know of a company on, and you're joining us today and you think they've done some really interesting TCFD reporting, whether that just be on strategy or across the whole report, do contact us at the CDSB Secretariat because we are developing a series of case studies for the hub. Um, there's already some on there and we'd love to showcase, showcase your, your report and your, and your work and, and tell that story to help others. So please, please do let us know. Uh, I cannot tell you how uh, the, the, the drive that we've had of companies coming to the TCFD hub lately. I think it's gone up by 80,000 in the last few months um, across a six month period. So there's a huge amount of interest in this portal if you want to show off your reporting. But just before I move on quickly, I've got a couple of questions come through in the chat. Um, this one is for, I think it's for David, but Nonto, please do come in. Should all the climate disclosures Address in the address in the guidance be disclosed in the mainstream company report, or can some elements be disclosed in the sustainability report? Yes. So the um, as I think I mentioned in my presentation, the guidance offers a, a real range of reporting suggestions. Um, as I said, some companies will it will be necessary to cover all of them uh, if the materiality determination is out so. Uh, for others, it might be a limited number of the suggestions they take up. It's all about the materiality assessment and what is decision useful for investors. Um, so CDSB is focused on the mainstream report. Um, we understand that companies want to report this information to a wider group of stakeholders. Um, so as long as the information is consistent, um, yeah, other things can be disclosed in the sustainability report, but if it's material, then it should be in the mainstream report. I think you're on mute there, Marta. Thanks, David. Sorry, I was witching out here, here in the Brian house. We have to get everyone out to the nursery and school, so I put myself on mute. Thank you, David. Uh, so, um, I was just going to say that the sustainability, I think you want to reduce the reporting burden as much as you possibly can and use information for as many different audiences as you can. So uh, great response, David. 
Uh, our next question is, do you see more Asian and Japanese companies reaching out for assistance using the TDSB framework on climate? Are there best practice examples we could refer to? Well, I might take a stab at that and then hand over to my colleagues. Now, we run a program um, which Nonto can touch on as well, called Beyond Disclosure, which is a service that review company reports um, a very small amount of money. Um, and actually, the majority of companies that have paid for that service are Japanese companies. CDSC ran a pilot project in Japan about seven years ago where we translated the framework, which is now pretty much the TCFD recommendations, into Japanese. And we got a huge amount of support by CDP for that. Um, so this, this framework and as it's evolved, it's pretty much be, has been tested in Japan. Um, and we're also members of the TCFD consortium in Japan and they're supporting METI and others um, with some of their thinking and their, their guidance and the stock exchange around that. The CDSB um, work with SASB on the implementation and the case studies in terms of the examples you're referring to have also been translated into Japanese and I think are freely available on the Japanese website. I'm oh, sorry, the Japanese stock exchange website. So have a look on there and they should all be there. Uh, for you to enter that one, David or Nonjo, did you want to add anything else? No, I will take that as uh, I'll take that as read. Uh, um, and there is a question: Will these slides be available afterwards? Yes, they will be. Though I think the link will be sent to all participants, but they'll also be available on our website, along with this recording this morning and the recording we do this afternoon, because we do we do this in two time zones, so we can make it as accessible as possible. So that will be everywhere. Um, just the next, the next question that I have is, I'm just going to ask Nonto this one. How do I start using the guidance in the CDSB framework to improve my company's disclosure on climate related information? So what I'm just going to start to look at um, what they're already doing within the organization. So any uh, risk management processes that they already have in place and kind of do like a, a gap analysis using the, the framework. So it's very useful to kind of, well, if you especially if you look at the checklist that are available in the guidance, um, see what your disclosures look like and uh, then um, see where the gaps are and where you can actually um, fill in those gaps using the framework. So um, yeah, and also I think the resources could also be useful in order to give that additional background. Um, so to one company where um, they were still sort of trying to understand all the different um, tools that are available to them. So I think the resources are very exceptionally useful for, for somebody who wants to see what is actually out there, what is it that I can use. So yeah, um, I think that's uh, useful to do. And just following on for that, how does the CDSB framework, how do we at CDSB work with corporates, just to address the question we started to touch on earlier, um, to start, start on their climate journey? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very um, a great question. I saw it earlier, actually. Um, I actually had planned to talk a bit on that, but I don't know, somehow we seem to have missed the slide. Um, so uh, would CDSB offers companies some support in terms of um, integrating information into their mainstream reporting. Um, this is in the form of looking at their reporting and kind of doing um, some reviews, high level reviews, and we go into also the reporting under even the EU NFRD um, to see kind of where um, they could make improvements and where they also see as a company that they would like to make improvements and then we kind of assist them on that journey. So it's more of a journey to either aligning with TCFD or um, um, enhancing their disclosures to make those more decision, um, decision useful for investors. So looking at um, how issues of um, comparability and um, consistency and coherency with regards to the information, so how is it structured within the mainstream report? So it, it's kind of like um, a way to actually um, take companies to, their, to the next level um, of their reporting on climate related issues, regardless of where they are. And where we come across companies that are actually in the early stages, uh, we find that a lot of them are already, say, speaking to um, or working with companies like well, organizations like CDP. So they're already kind of structuring the data. So where the data is already structured, it's very useful then for us to sort of come in and, and help companies um, actually um, integrate that within their mainstream reporting. Thanks, Nonto. And do you want to talk a little about the service that you have available to European companies? Mm -hmm. 
So for European companies, uh, we offer this uh, free service, which again, I've mentioned these as reviews, they, they are free. You mentioned beyond the disclosure, which is actually a, a bit low fee, but for EU companies, because it's funded by the EU, we can offer the service free to companies where uh, we can actually analyze their dis disclosures and um, then we kind of give them feedback. And part of what we've been doing, and you touched on it earlier, is giving them feedback on their disclosures under the EU non-financial reporting directive. So we gave them an analysis and um, a review of that. And we, again, are very much available to provide um, answers as and when they, they need uh, those responses, uh, they can send, us, can send us an email and we also quickly jump on calls where necessary and conduct some workshops which are focused on the region based again on the wonderful analysis that's sometimes done by our technical team um, looking at the specific uh, reporting in those regions and it's a very much uh, evolving program so we are working on, on developing some uh, service offering that we'll be sharing with companies uh, very soon so we're excited to be doing that. Oh, that sounds fun. I even look forward to hearing more about that uh, from my perspective. And just one very last question, so please do keep them coming in the chat. I have one more here. Can I use this application guidance to meet the local regulatory requirements? Can you take that maybe, David, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the CDSP framework, we set out clearly that um, national, regional, national regulation always supersedes the framework. However, in the majority of countries, I think, um, materiality is the kind of like defining principle as to what should be included in the mainstream annual report. Um, so if climate change is a material issue for your company, then that information should be going in the mainstream report and going to investors so they can properly analyze that information along with the other financial material information kept there. Do you think that covers everything, Marta? That does cover everything, and I think the important part is the connectivity, isn't it, David, across the reporting um, as a whole. We are seeing some really interesting TCFD reporting, but it's kind of standalone and not connecting to the numbers, and the financial impacts are not being presented as yet. So we're hoping this guidance can play a role in, in helping to do that, along with some work of our colleagues in the TW, in our technical working group at the moment, who are doing a lot of really interesting work on um, looking at existing accounting standards and how they can also be used. Uh, from a climate perspective as well as examples. So with no further questions in the chat, if you enjoyed this so much, tell your colleagues and come back for this afternoon session. Um, my colleague Michael Zimini will be chairing this afternoon session, but we'll have David and Nantikoza with their expertise again. You can always email us questions. You can contact us via any social media channel. All of our contact emails, if you've got a specific question for David or Nantikoza, are on our website. So please do go on there and let us know what you think. Try the guidance. Again, let us know. We we're always up for improvements and feedback. Um, this is you know, in a really important area. There is a huge amount of urgency and we must get moving uh, fast if we're going to meet any of our, our targets and uh, some of the, the meet the some of the important science uh, targets that David mentioned earlier in his presentation with the urgency point. Um, so with that, I'd like to wish you all a good morning, afternoon and evening, depending where you are in the world. Thank you for joining our webinar today, and we look forward to you joining another one very soon. Thank you very much. The CDSB would like to thank the LIFE program of the European Union and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their contribution and support of the project.